everyone that uh, sows into this ministry, I really appreciate you and thank you so much for honoring me. Thank you so much for all the love and adoration that you show me and help me out. You know, there's so much power when you are given a ministry to love on a prophet of God. It is a profound place because the prophet of God is where all of your prosperity happens. I mean, all the things that are supposed to take place during the course of your life, it starts to happen when you connect with your prophet of God. It can't happen. That's why if you look back at your life, you'd be like, you know, well, why didn't I do this? And why did I say this? But at the same token, you look back, you didn't have the prophet of God. You see what I'm saying? So uh, even when people look back at their life and reflect and be like, well, how come I didn't know this and say this? And why did I have children then? And why did I get married then? And why did I go into this relationship then? And why did I do this? And why did I open up myself to this? But remember, you didn't have the prophet of God. When the prophet of God comes into your life, now you have a special advantage given to you. The prophet of God is the grace of God being added unto you so that you could have a different mind, a different emotion, a different desire, a different appetite. So when you walk in love towards your prophet of God, you unlock everything that you're supposed to have in this life, including hell. There's a powerful place that a person enters to treat their prophet of God with honor and respect. And when they get there, it also liberates their own soul in their personal life. It takes them out of secret sin. It takes them out of wickedness, ungodliness. And it takes them out of unselfishness. Remember, witchcraft is driven by selfishness. Before Saul chose not to kill the Amalekites, Saul is selfish. He's in his self. He's thinking about what is the best decision. So is all selfishness. But see, if he was an unselfish person, he would have succeeded in that moment because the prophet of God had told him to kill all the Amalekites. He would have succeeded. But he didn't succeed because of selfishness. Selfishness is a very dangerous mental block on God. When you become selfish, you cannot hear God from a pure place. You'll hear him, but you can't hear him from a pure place. And when I say pure place, there will be a combative system within you to what he's saying. Remember, um, the Pharisees, every time Jesus said something, they found fault with it somehow. If Jesus said, uh, I come to... Uh, your sins are forgiven you. They found a way to. No, it is not right. If Jesus said, um, stretch out your hands on the Sabbath, they found a way to say, no, that's not right. When Jesus said, drink of my flesh, uh, dr uh, eat of my flesh, drink of my blood, they found a way to say, no, this is not right. Because they wasn't hearing him from a pure place. When you're selfish, you can't hear God correctly. When you're unselfish, you could hear God correctly. You could take in what he's saying with the right approach, right, right response to it, right cooperation to it, right reaction to it. You know, sin makes you hide. It takes away your confidence. When you live a sinful life, you also have to live a hidden life. Sin takes away the confidence to, to feel free in the presence of God because that slavery will trickle over to your personality. Whenever sin is present in one's life, they lose their influence. It means that the, the way that the light of God was supposed to shine through them is not. And so when people encounter you while you're in sin, they don't get what you was created to give them, which is conviction, which is the desire to change, which is the desire to seek God and become like God. So the whole purpose of sin, Satan wanted to take you out 
of the image of God and how the Lord wanted you to be, see, how he wanted you to act. When you are in sin, you do not have the same level of attendance. Sin takes you into absentee. It takes you, it disconnects you from God's activities. That's what sin does. So if a person enters into sin, they, they, they cancel out the lifeline of God in their soul. They cancel out that umbilical cord where God is able to feed them. And one thing that sin does is it makes you a wanderer. Sin makes you a wanderer. That means that that, that that you you're not focused on one thing, one mission. Like you're 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 finding out. Okay, this bishop is doing this. Okay, okay, this rapper doing this. Okay, this singer doing this. Okay, this actress doing this. Okay, okay, this going on in the news. Okay, this is what the president doing. Is sin makes you a wanderer? You you notice if you look at King Jesus. King Jesus is never talking about the next king in Jerusalem. He's never talking about the politic, the politics. He's not talking about all these different type of things. You notice that his theme all the time is, I'm preparing you all because I'm going to lay down my life. I'm going to be delivered up by the Jews to be crucified. Da, da, da. I'm going to rise again after three days. And you notice he's not wandering. He has one specific thing that he's after, which is you. It's powerful. Jesus had one aim, you. One desire, you. So even in his life, he's saying, I'm laying down my life because you are more important than my temptations. So Jesus made you more important than his temptations. So no man could truly love God until you make Jesus more important than your temptation. See, Jesus made you more important than all the things that would distract him. Remember, Jesus is on the cross and they're telling him at the cross, come down. Deliver yourself. But Jesus won't come down because he made you the priority. And how many times do you come down from your cross? Because you haven't made him the priority. See, these days that you have remaining on earth is simply about will you have the same response to Jesus that Jesus had to you? That's that, that's what the remaining days that you have on earth. This is why you 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 you're given mercy every day. You're you you're woken up by God. You don't just wake up because somebody tapped you on your shoulder. Because if God doesn't release His oxygen, you they'll tap you on the shoulder and rest. You you won't wake. You don't wake up because you you have some type of thing on your phone that, that wakes you up. That's not the reason why you wake up. You woke up because God decided, I'm going to give her another opportunity to worship me. I'm going to give him another opportunity to honor me. And the whole purpose behind the existence every day is to lay down your life for Jesus like he laid down his life for you. All of the kingdom of heaven is built up on laying down your life for Jesus. Everything that God requires you to do is a part of you laying down your life for Jesus. Work is the wisdom for seed to sow. But the seed being sown is the wisdom for wealth, health, and all of the blessing. 
You lay down your life to get the type of provisions that you're supposed to have. All of your provision is in laying down your life. I was thinking about it. Saints, when you work real hard, it takes a toll on your body. How many of y'all ever experienced that? Well, you ain't got to tell me. But if you have ever worked hard, these last 15 years of my life, 15 years? No, I want to say these last 12 to 13 years of my life, I've been working real hard. It takes a toll on your physical body. Your body feels it. Now, if you want to go into debt, working hard is something that God does also. In the book of Genesis, the first thing that we see is God presenting himself as a worker. The first thing that he starts to show you is this is my work and it was good. I had to work to create the fish. I had to work. Now, saints, I, I, I want to say something real strong to you and this is so amazing. When a man has a child, the, the, the child comes out as a person, male or female. Because the sperm of a man is created to produce another man, which is male or female. But the sperm of God is multifaceted. His seed produces fishes, whales, eagles. Tigers, elephants, zebras, ants, his seed produces serpents. God himself is a divine serpent. All of, and that's why the serpent had the highest level of God's genius in it. And that's why the enemy wanted to use that serpent. That was the top. That was the Lamborghini animal. That was the Lamborghini creature. That, that was the Bugatti creature. That was the Louis Vuitton creature. That, that, that was the Gucci, the, the Gucci creature. When Satan wanted to talk, to Adam in the garden, Satan said, no, 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 I, I need the top. I need, I need the best. I need, I need, I need the electric car. I need the, I, I need, I need the top, the top technology amongst the creatures. And the serpent was the pig. So the, as you can see, the origin of serpents is not evil. The origin of serpents is wise wisdom. So a, a serpent really represents wisdom. Wisdom is so powerful that if it is even evil wisdom, it can convince you down a path of self-destruction. Let me give you an example. You notice that people that smoke weed, they'll tell you that the earth, it came from the earth, it's natural. That's wisdom. But it's evil. That's the wisdom that Apostle James was saying is earthly, sensual, demonic. When people have evil wisdom, if you don't know the truth, they'll convince you because they'll tell you a whole bunch of things that makes sense, but it doesn't make righteousness. 
They'll tell you things to convince you and, and they'll psychologically take you down a path that will confuse you if you're not already solidified in the correct knowledge. They'll tell you certain things the same way. Have you ever seen two people that God said was an abomination for them to be together? You ever saw them hugging and kissing? And they'll tell you stories like this person took care of me when I was sick. This person was in the hospital with me. And it'll sound like a love story. It's wisdom. But it's evil wisdom. You notice when they was about to kill Jezebel, the man shouted out, who will who toss over? Come on. What, what, what's up? Y'all going to let her live? Come on, come on, somebody stand with me and get her. Now, if the person, if be, before they tossed her down, if somebody would have said, let's protect her and care for her, would you say that that's divine love and loyalty? That's the righteousness of God? No. They said, no, 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 don't kill her, man. Thou shalt not kill. Don't kill her. You see, it was righteousness. Now, if somebody would have said, don't kill her, thou shalt not kill, it would have been wisdom, but evil wisdom. We often meet people with evil wisdom. That's why you see the Pharisees, they didn't tell Jesus, we are demons and we come to attack you. Ra ra ra. They said, we are children of Abraham. Huh? They just said something that is of wisdom. How could you pull that out? That's deep. How could you pull that out and be demon possessed? You just said that you're a child of Abraham. Children, the, the revelation about being a child of Abraham is of the kingdom. So how could you speak that? And be demon possessed. It's wisdom. But evil wisdom. That's why if you yourself don't walk in humility and submission to God's will. And you don't seek him correctly and, and keep your heart in the correct place. You yourself will become a person of evil wisdom. That means that at one point, you will determine that I actually am okay that I'm missing God. I, I, I'm okay that I sin. It, you know, it, it, how do we stop it? How do we stop it? I done, I done, I done heard. I done, I done did what I was, what I was told to do. But I'm still like this. Now you know why many people choose to be prisoners to what God said is an abomination to him. He said not to live like that. But now our generation is trying to come to us and present it to us all the time. So it, it, so it, in a sense, it'll look like, oh, no, 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 no. God is with this. Do you know? Uh, the word of God talked about there'll come a time where preachers will, will, will come forth. There'll be preachers of lawlessness. There'll be preachers of wickedness. And they will come and preach to you the doctrine of devils. Saints, anytime you see something in the word God says is abomination and somebody comes and they tell you, you know, people that live this type of life, they'll make it to heaven. That is wisdom. But it is evil wisdom. And saints, when you live so long being wicked, it becomes your concept until you boldly start professing it. You'll start boldly 
advocating for it, and it'll become your frame of speech and opinion, and you will also encourage others to do the same. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Blessed are the peacemakers. People that make God's reaction to a situation. The theme of an environment. Whoa, whoa, whoa. They make God's will what he wants to see. The theme of everywhere they go. That's big. Blessed are those that make God's response to a scenario, the theme, the subject of every place where they go. We played four basketball games today, full court. We played four, four basketball games. We were playing with some big old guys too. Them boys was big. They six, six something in height. We, so I had a great, I had great games in all those games. I had great assists, great shots, all that stuff. But towards the end, there, there was a young man came. He, he, he was an older gentleman, like he's 40, 30 something years old. Give me a second. And something happened. Give me a second. He recognized and saw me as a captain. We had, we do something in basketball where before we start the tournament, to pick captains, you shoot a long three-pointer. So I shot, my first shot, I shot the three, made it. I was a captain. There was another boy, a captain. And that brother didn't believe in deodorant. I'm going to tell you that right now. I don't know what it is. But I don't know what it is. But it's... It's, and then it's hard when you're trying to guard somebody. And they, 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 they. Saints, when you meet somebody like that, you're, you're spend extra time in the shower just trying to hope that none of their residues got on you. Zanes and then his other teammate, and, and I started thinking about these niggas here, these niggas ain't put no deodorant on so that they could win the match. They used it because because every time the skunk shot, the skunk, It, it was a it was a strategy. It was a missile. It was a strategy. It was. It's, 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 it's hard to guard somebody when they. Now watch this here. So there was a guy like thirty something, forty something, and he asked me, "Could I play in the next match?" And I I said, "Yeah." And he was like, I have two people with me. But they were children. And he went on to tell me, now, we're only playing all big old men. Big old men. 
But the guy represent, he, he realized that I was a captain. So he came to me seeking favor. Here's what I did. I told him yes. I said, bring bring them in, in their play in, in watch this here. About the fourth game, we found a way to let the two children that he was training, uh, a young boy and a young girl, they're about 10 something in age, 10 and eight. And he's training them. I let him play the next match. Now, his was so wild. I switched the whole status of what we was doing in there. And nobody refuted me. Everybody came in subjection to that, even though it was the, everybody's desire. We don't want to play with no little children. We definitely don't want to play with no little children because we, we playing rough. We, we playing aggressive. But to be a peacemaker, you got to go beside your preference of reaction in order for you to do something that God wants to do. Before I left, the guy kept thanking me. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And he was real good. He was he, he could play like the NBA. He, he real good. He was real good. And We ended up coaching his own children while we, while they were there because if, if they miss something, you know, children like to get they, they they get embarrassed, they get stuff, and we end up coaching them and already giving them a winner's mindset. Now that thing trickled over into Jesus. It trickles over into the gospel. Because even in life, if you think that you missed the mark at one point, what the hell are you going to do? You going to sit there and wallow and be sad for yourself and continue? Or are you going to make the correct shots in your decisions? You going to keep on missing the shots? Or oh, I messed up, so I just going to stay here and die and and lay down and let Satan just rape my destiny away and take my destiny away. Or you going to get up and start making the right moves. You got to get out of the place of just letting things be so passive. And you got to say to yourself, I'm going to be a peacemaker. I'm going to make wholeness happen wherever I go. Wherever I go, I'm going to make wholeness happen. If I go here, wholeness is going to happen because I'm not going to have my own reactions to this. I'm not going to be the one deciding what I want to do and is wrong. I'm going to let God be the one acting out his reaction through me. See? Whenever somebody is a peacemaker, they are someone that is taking on the behavior of God. God's behavior is now being seen through you. A peacemaker is carrying the conduct of Christ. Now, now let me let me give you another revelation about peacemaking. The peacemaker is very prophetic because even when they got the chance to act 
unruly and hostile, they'll choose to still let God speak his peace or not speak his peace through them. See, see, Jesus had many chances to say, I'm going to show you, devil. The devil said, turn these stone into bread if you're the son of God. If you're the son of God, command the angel, he'll command his angel, come on, hop off this mountain, commit suicide. Watch, I, I, bet, I bet the angel will pop out like Psalm 91 promise, right? Right, Jesus? Right, Jesus? And Jesus got so many times to take the moment of flesh and Jesus never took the moment of flesh. Because a peacemaker is very prophetic. Even when all things lead to a certain action, their action is still guided by the Spirit. When Jesus is up on the cross, they're they giving Jesus all the reason to come down. They told him, if, if you're if you really real, then come down. Come on. Come on. What you, what you, what you, what you going to do? Y'all, you getting punked right now. What's up? And, and you up there talking about you're powerful. And they're using every strategy to talk Jesus into troublemaking. But Jesus sticks with peacemaking. Many people don't walk in peacemaking because you're going to have to look like an ass. You're going to have to. You're going to have to look like you're stupid. But if you understand the foolishness of God is wiser than man's wisdom. The weakness of God is stronger than man's strength. The Lord has built up moments of divine foolishness where he is the one conducting himself through you while your centrality is telling you, no, it should be this way. No, it should be this way. Why do you think that you have conversations in your mind? And you argue with people in your mind. How many times you ever cuss somebody out in your mind? You be up there looking in the mirror. You nigga, nigga, you nigga. You, you, but you, how, how you going to tell me that? You, yeah, you crazy, baby. You crazy. Nobody ever told you you crazy. You crazy. You know how many times people cuss people out? And nobody is around. They're talking to their self because everybody got that hell in them. You got that hell in you. You could talk in tongues. You can, hallelujah, I love the Lord, all that stuff. But you get in the right situation, you see how you start talking to yourself. And you're not saying things that are good. You're saying what you wanted to say and you didn't say. That's why sometimes when people get into an argument, they say what they want to say ASAP because they have wanted to say that the last time. But they didn't say it. And they held on to it so that then the next time come, they explode and say it. You're crazy, baby. Nobody ever going to tell you you're crazy. You're crazy. Hide the knives and hide your wives because you're crazy, baby. But why are those things going on in the brain? The brain is already after flesh. All oh, the years that you're born, your brain goes after flesh. It's not after spirit. The spirit is a peacemaker. The spirit does not wait for you to calm down. The spirit releases the strategy of calmness. The, the spirit does not wait for you to be mature. The spirit is mature. The spirit does not wait for you to say the right thing. The spirit says the right thing. When you're in the spirit, you take dominion. You're not waiting for nobody. You are the dominator of who you choose to be. If you have to wait, you're a fleshly person. And there's not much success that you're going to achieve during the course of your life. 
Because God built his system for only people that spirit. You got to be spirit. Because saints, when I look at my life, my sowing, when I sowed, the things that happened next were not always confirmation of the seed I sowed. Some, sometimes the things that happen next are completely contrary to the seed and what it activates because Satan try to bluff you. Satan will buffet you and attempt to create doubt and unbelief after you sow. You honor God. Now you're in a dishonorable situation in life. The situation you're in is dishonorable. But you done sold honor. You respected God, obeyed God, did what God told you to do. And now you're in a situation where it seems like Satan has more of an advantage over you. Mm. Here is Job a sower and his wife tells him, curse God and die. Because look at what's happening to you. Now, now, saints, we never really think about this. Why did she say curse God? Why did she say curse the devil, the devil attacking you? Why was her first reaction was curse God? Because in her mind, she felt as though you obey God. And look at what God is doing to you. But a punk ass can't see that there's double riches coming in just a couple moments, couple days. Which is, which is the problem with everybody? She can't see that here God about to give us multi-billionaire status. We was already the richest. We gonna be the richest of the rich. But the evil wisdom, the brain tells her, we done sold and look at what we reaping. Baby, this ain't what you reaping. This is a test. This not what you're reaping. This is a test. And if you pass the test, what you're reaping shows up. You don't pass the test. What you are reaping does not show up. And here's a moment where you and keep on sowing. But instead, she says, curse God. That means don't bless him no more. Don't sow into him no more. Because look at what we reaping. Let's leave him alone. Because look at what our investment is doing. But nobody is looking at the double riches. How come? Saints, Job didn't even see the double riches. But he had feared God enough not to stop. See, there's a realm of loyalty and friendship that you have with God that even when you can't prophetically see the fullness of his plan, you still ain't going to go against what he trained you to do. Joe was like, I know I'm going through some stuff right now, but I, I still, that's not my solution. I'm not going back on what he taught me. I, I'm not going to stop doing what he trained me to do. I, this, this is not what I'm bargaining for. I don't want this stuff to happen to me right now. What I feared has come upon me, but I'm still ain't going to stop what he done trained me to do. I'm going to stick with the kingdom. Now, meanwhile, double riches. Nobody's seeing the double riches. 
So when God is giving you power to stop watching porn, can't you see the double riches? When God telling you to stop fornicating, can you see the double riches? When God telling you to delete the person out of your phone, don't call them, don't text, can you see the double riches? Nobody is seeing. Why is God telling me don't go there no more? Why is God telling me to disconnect? Why is God telling me stop living like that? Why is God telling me to come out of the sin? Can you see the double riches? No, no, no. You just looking at the instruction. But can you see the double riches? Nobody saw the double riches. Saints, Isaac did not see the same year he was going to receive a hundredfold. He did not know that the harvest was right there in the same 2023. But he was sowing. This is the year where everything he fantasized and dreamed about is ready, is prepared, and is about to be dispersed right into his bosom. And he keeps on sowing and he sees an overwhelming Tsunami, a tidal wave of God's wealth touching him. This ain't what the famine was showing Isaac. This not what the problems was showing Isaac. Isaac is now in double riches. God has a kingdom that it tries you with instructions. But all the double and the provisions and the supplies is already made. You say no to it, you got to be a fool and live underneath this deception of this world system. But if you say yes to his ideas, there's pleasures forevermore. It doesn't stop. Saints, the powerful thing about living blessed versus having a lot of stuff, when you're blessed, when you have a lot of stuff, you're not going to take that stuff into hell. The rich man didn't have no water, but this man was drinking out of gold cups, wearing purple linen, blue linen, wearing the priestly robes. He had the finest of plates, finest of servants, but he goes to hell. Nobody is serving him. Nobody is feeding him. He ain't got no food. He's hungry. He's thirsty. He asks Abram, he, Lazarus, can Lazarus come and pick a drop of tongue, a, 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 a water on my tongue? Not even swallow the water. Let me just feel what water feels like again. When you have a lot of stuff, you can't take it with you. When, there are musicians that when they went down to hell, all that they lived in, they don't have it no more. All the lavishness they have is no more. Now suffering, torment, torture, torture, Hell is a place of torture. Hell is a place of torture. Demons torture you because you didn't receive God. They torment you because you rejected Jesus. But when you bless, all that you have today, you get to continue in the abundance of that same thing for all eternity. So saints, if you, if you wear a lot of nice necklaces, when you go into eternity forever, you're going to wear all the nice necklaces, even necklaces you never knew about, diamonds you never knew about. It's going to continue. You have a lot of houses. You get to enjoy the houses forevermore in eternity. You have a lot of cars. You get to enjoy the cars forevermore in eternity. 
Jesus said, store treasures in heaven where there's no thieves. Where there's no destruction. Where nothing rottens away. You get to enjoy it. Jesus said, in my father's house are many mansions. Who the mansions belong to? Sowers. The mansions belong to sowers. They're continuing the lavish life that they are locked through honoring God. Taking care of him as he appeared to them in a body, as a prophet, as an apostle, as a teacher of the word. And as they sowed and they unleashed the hundredfold lifestyle while they was in this life, it continues into the next life. Jesus said that the hundredfold in Mark chapter 10, I believe, it says that it's for this life and in the life to come. The harvest just keep on coming. The money just keep on flowing. It never stops. The Lord takes all that you achieved in this life, doubles it, increases it, triples it, quadruples it, and brings it to you forever for you to enjoy. The Lord want to stuff your face with his provisional grace. And that's why I'm going to speak over you right now. In the name of Jesus, all my partners, I speak over you a blessed week. All of you all that saw into me, I decree the money cometh mantle and all of the ministering spirits in money cometh. These angels, this angelic host, the financial host of God to minister for you. All oh, this Monday, this Tuesday, this Wednesday, this Thursday, this Friday, this Saturday. I speak the blessing, the empowerment of good success and prosperity over you. I speak all of you over you that sow into me. You serve and sow into me. I decree over you that your soul be free from the chains of darkness. I speak over you that sin would die in your heart, that the resurrection power of Jesus will live in your heart to be risen from death, to be risen from sin and iniquity. I speak the blood of Jesus in the new bloodline, which is the blood of Jesus. I speak it to be made manifest, to be made manifest. And I decree over you that the blessing of Abraham, that you will experience the transfer of wealth and riches and health, longevity and salvation that Abraham also walked in during the course of his life. Remember, Abraham was so healthy that even after Sarai died, he got remarried and had more children. That means all his parts was working. His blood was good. His life was good. His body was still working. He had energy. It takes a lot of energy to make a child. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? That's not no easy thing. And he had several other children. That's the blessing of Abraham. Your energy in your body is restored. Your blood is made clean in your body. I want to say something amazing that the Spirit of God was talking to me about. When you are a seed sower and you're giving God a lot of money, a lot of provision, your account is full of acts of kindness towards Jehovah God. You're a worshiper of King Jesus. You're blessing him. You're giving him large money. Let me tell you something. The Spirit of God told me this. You carry divine blood in your veins. And the Lord began to say to me, look at Abel. When he is murdered by his brother, I told his brother that his blood crieth out from the ground. How is the spirit realm saturated with the blood speaking from Abel's body? 
because his blood was divine just like Christ. See, sowing carries a bloodline of anti-fornication, anti-pornography, anti-sin, anti-lust, anti-love for the world, anti-distraction, anti-fear. That's why Cain wanted to kill his brother because he don't got divine blood flowing through his veins. He has evil blood, which is hatred, jealousy, cruelty, death, murder. But here's David. No, no, Abel rather. Abel is moving with divine blood. And Abel is able to sow continuously without any weariness. The Bible said he will give God his fatlings. He will give God the fat. He was giving God fat money, fat seeds because he was overwhelmed with the right blood. He was working the right blood, not the blood of evil, not the blood of hate, but the blood of love. David, all of his brothers never walked where he was. Remember, they even told him not to fight Goliath. But David was a sower. He had divine blood flowing through his veins. Saints, I'm going to say something that you never heard before. When David wanted to build a house for the Lord, the Lord said, no, it's okay because I had you shed too much blood. I had you, I had you slaughter people for me. That's okay. I'm going to use your son. He, 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 he didn't have that warrior type thing, assignment. Now look at this. This is real powerful. Listen to what I'm about to say. David shed blood. But he had divine blood flowing through him. I want you to hear this. David was able to destroy Philistines, which were enemies of God, which mean that they had demonic blood. I want you to see this. So every time David shed blood, it was evidence that he had destroyed the bloodline and the lifestyle of Satan that was operating in a region on earth. Listen to this. When you are a sower, you have divine blood imparted to you by God. You can choose not to use it because many do choose not to use it. But if you do wake up and use it, You'll recognize that God uses you to destroy the bloodline of Satan in every region you go, in every family line, and on the earth, wherever you go, you will shed the blood of devils because their lifestyle will not be able to influence you. Your divine blood will shine through in your lifestyle. And you will be like Christ laying down your life for your brethren because there's somebody needs the good you, not the wicked you, not the whole. They don't need the fornicator. They don't need the liar, the poor.